This is the Authentic Sex Podcast, real life conversations about sex, pleasure and relationships. I'm your host, Juliet Allen. Welcome to another episode of the Authentic Sex Podcast. Today, I am hosting a Q&A for you. So I put the call out. I asked you what you guys want to know about sex and relationships and life. And I'm answering your questions, which is so much fun. There's some really great questions in here. So I'm sitting in front of my fireplace tonight, answering them for you and covering all sorts of topics. So we cover trust, we cover sex, magic, fantasies, getting back with an ex, G-spot and cervical orgasms, high standards in dating, um, connecting to your body during self-pleasure, being in the sexology industry, imposter syndrome, gosh, so many topics. What else? Breastfeeding, um, how to transition as a mother from breastfeeding and, you know, your whole, the whole identity thing, which I totally relate to. Um, porn habits came up. Erectile challenges came up. Date ideas, that was a good one and a fun one. I spoke about Nick and I's dates. Navigating a relationship with someone who has children, also something I've experienced. Um, And experiencing dating with a child. So I'm speaking about being a single parent and dating. So, and I think I spoke about um, navigating relationships too, just in general. So, you know. There's so much in this episode and I really love doing Q&As because for me, it means that I'm helping you individually. And the great thing about asking a question is that guaranteed if you are asking the question, there's always a handful of others who wanted to ask it. So the answers I know guarantee won't just help one of you, it will help many of you. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. If you do have your own question, feel free to email me and I will do my best to respond in the next Q&A. This episode of Authentic Sex is sponsored by the Juliet Pleasure Wand. The Juliet is a premium crystal pleasure wand designed to heighten your sexual energy, increase self-love and self-pleasure, expand your orgasmic experiences and connect you to your true sexual essence. You can read more and purchase your own crystal wand by visiting my website, www.juliet-allen.com. I have so many questions this month and they're all super interesting. So yeah, sit back and enjoy or do your exercise and enjoy. So let's get stuck right in. Um, The first question is about trust. It says, I struggle with trusting people due to past experiences, not just romantically, but in all relationships, professionally and even with family. I'm in therapy to work on this as it has led me to isolate myself and hold on to resentment, cutting people off. I long to be vulnerable and trust openly without building walls around my heart and feeling alone. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, This is a really big one and by you sharing, you're going to help other people because this is such a common one, trust. It's been a a theme for me um, over the years, especially in my, I would say up to about age 35, I had so many trust issues and they um, they were a result of stuff from my childhood and my teenage years that was unresolved and um yeah and I just I have been so committed over the years to consistently working on my trust stuff because like you it made me sabotage relationships it um it, it contributed to me feeling alone and it just caused so much anxiety like worrying about who I can trust and who I can't, who's going to cheat on me and who isn't. So, um, yeah, I'm so, so, like, congratulations on having the courage to get into a therapist and to work on it because it takes courage to do that. Like, it really does. It takes courage to find a therapist, to pay for a therapist, to book it in, 
to show up and to do the fucking work and you're doing it and um, you need to be proud of yourself and celebrate that. Once you get to the bottom of, like there's going to be an experience or two or three from the early days in your life, no doubt, where your trust was broken by someone very important to you. It could have been your mother, your father, your first love, you know, a family member. And often that's what then sets us up as adults for not trusting anybody or not trusting men or not trusting women or whatever. So it's so important that you get to the bottom of what that moment was and the story you put to that experience um, and then also just actively choose to let, let go of that story. That's a big one. The next question, hi, Juliet, could you speak to getting unstuck from a job that doesn't inspire you and going on to find one's calling and purpose? It's been a big and very frustrating topic for me the last months and years, daring to drop a career in marketing that doesn't feel fulfilling, wanting a change yet being unsure what it should be otherwise be, being afraid to leave the security of a good paycheck every month. It's been a big and frustrating topic for me the last months and years, daring to drop a... Oh, <laughs> That's a double up in two sentences. <sighs> okay, yep, I can speak to this. Thank you for asking. Yet another one that no doubt many will relate to. Um, okay, yeah. So to feel fulfilled and to feel deep joy and to feel on purpose, I do really believe that it's it, it helps so much if we can be doing a job that we love, that we look forward to, that doesn't feel like work and that feels like we are serving not just ourselves but others in the world. Now, it sounds like you haven't found that yet, but the good news is you can find it. I, I, I'm not sure of your age, but I found sexology. I went through so many careers, my God just looking, just searching, searching for what felt purposeful for me. And so I decided to study sexology at the age of, how old was I? About 30, let's say. So I, before that, I was a doula, I was a yoga teacher, I ran a kids yoga business. I had a jewellery company that I made jewellery and I sold it to boutiques. Um, what else did I do? I worked as a barista, I made coffee. I've, I did all sorts of things, like all sorts of things, just searching. And, um, and I studied psychology too. So, um, oh, and I studied acupuncture, <laughs> like so many things. Keep searching, like to find what feels purposeful for you, you need to, to try different things. Like what do you really love? Like this is the question I asked myself when I was looking for a career change out of yoga. I, a friend said to me, what do you love? Like, what do you love most in life? And I was like, I love sex. I fucking love sex. Like, I can't get enough. And it, it was actually my therapist. I did a therapy session. And she said, well, how can you, like, make a career out of it? You know, how can you make a career out of your love of sex? Because this is a gift. And um, decided sex worker wasn't for me. And, but did my research and I found out I could study a master's in sexology. And so, like, ask yourself, like, what do you love? Like, what do you lie in bed at night? Like, do you lie in bed at night before you go to sleep or when you wake up in the night or when you wake up in the morning and think about something that's not marketing, obviously, that, like, really lights you up? What is that? That's what you've got to do. What are your gifts? Like, when, when friends, if friends described you, what would they say about you? What gifts do you bring to the world by being uniquely you? Whatever that is, that's what you want to turn into a career. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. I can't think off the top of my head of any resources actually that um, I have on my podcast or journal that speak to this topic. So thanks for bringing it up because it could be a good one to cover in the future. Okay, next question is... Um, my question is, thinking of sex magic and manifestation, could it be unsafe to fantasise about something you actually don't want to happen while self-pleasuring as sexual energy is so powerful? For example, if you fantasise 
and self-pleasure about a forbidden situation that it would be devastating if it happened in real life. Is there any dangerous danger in fantasizing? Could you be doing sex magic or manifesting something without wanting? Is there such thing as unconscious manifesting while fantasizing? Well, this is such a great question. I don't have the answer. <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend I do. It's it's made me think, you know. I, I've thought about this before because, like, whether we admit it or not, we all fantasize about, at some stage in life, random stuff, whether it's fucking our neighbor or a fucking a family member or some forbidden situation, you know, our teacher, our doctor, I don't know, all the things. They're all out there. They all, we all have our kinks and it's normal and it's natural and there's nothing wrong with it. And so your question is, you know, does that kind of unconsciously manifest stuff? Look, I don't think it does because I, I think like intuitively I feel like our mind compartmentalizes, um, you know, so let, let's give you the example of fantasizing about our teacher. Let's do something really vanilla. Fantasizing about fucking our teacher. Like when we do that and we get turned on, we're not feeling like, like okay, let's go back. Manifesting is the art of, of genuinely feeling all the gratitude and the emotions that come with, pardon the pun, come with um, a dream, a vision we have for our life. Say, for example, we want to manifest conceiving a child and we really feel like into what it feels like to have that child in our belly. We feel into what does it feel like to birth that child into the world? What does it feel like to like breastfeed our own, you know, little baby for the first time? And like, so this is manifesting. It's like really feeling gratitude for how you feel and, and feeling what it's like to be that future self and to be in that future experience. So that's manifesting actively. But when we just masturbate and suddenly we have a vision of we're having sex with our teacher and it's forbidden, we're not, we're not going into emotionally like, oh, my God, how would it feel if this actually happened? We're just like, oh, yeah, he's going down on me. Hot, I come, you know, whatever. So I don't think... Like, I just, I wouldn't get up in your head around it. Like, I don't. And God, believe me, I've fantasized over weird shit before. And none of it's come to fruition. So that's my thoughts on that one. Thank you for asking. No one's ever asked me that one. Next question. Thoughts on getting back with an ex when it is, when it is appropriate. Tips for reconnecting, breaking old cycles, how to rebuild. Yeah, look, it can work, getting back with an ex. Sometimes what we need is a break from each other, a break to reconnect with ourself, a break to connect with our values in relationship, um, in what we want, what we don't want, what we'll settle for, what we won't settle for. And then coming back together and having, you know, those meaningful conversations that reconnect us and creating new relationship agreements, which is very necessary, by the way, if you get back together, um, can strengthen a relationship. So I'm, I'm a big advocate for having space. I'm a big advocate for reconnecting to self and then coming back together and seeing if it works. And this, I've done this twice. Once with an ex, we had a break, we got back together, but it just didn't work. And then with Nick, we had a month break very early on in our relationship and we got back together and look at us, like nearly seven years later, two kids, well, three kids, including, um, so three kids. <laughs> We've got three kids, but one of them, you know, I had before, Nick. Um, and our relationship is strong. So um, my, my tips are um, there is no rules. There are no rules, right? Um, to break old cycles, get a therapist and do couples therapy. It's the only way forward. Like I don't care what anyone says. If a relationship is having troubles, you need a therapist, you need a third party who is not a friend or family member or some random at the pub, whatever, colleague, I don't know, to help you. You need someone who is a professional, who does it for a living, who can help you guys reconnect, re-establish relationship boundaries and agreements and move forward. That's, that's the way. That's how you rebuild. You prioritise that, you pay for that and if you're really committed, you find someone. 
Next question. Let me just scroll up. I just bought your curved rose quartz pleasure wand, my first sex toy. Woohoo, woohoo, congrats. Um, I'm looking for resources on achieving G-spot and cervical orgasms. Do you have any recommendations about a good place to start with these? I'm having a major awakening of sexual energy at age 40. Awesome. And it's been wild. I'm in the midst of leaving a long-term marriage, choosing me and diving fully into self-love. Oh, how fucking exciting. Excuse my language. I love the word fuck for various reasons. How exciting. Like, fuck yeah. You're like... 40 and which is a powerful age fuck I'm 41 it's just been so awesome to turn 40 and yeah and you're leaving a long long term relationship which to be honest I find really exciting if it's not working because like oh my god the possibilities are endless like new lovers time to connect with self all the things how exciting and you bought a pleasure wand so my tip is take the focus off your clitoris if you are focusing on it just do a month no clitoral touching which can be really hard I don't find there's anything wrong with clits and touching our clit at all I love touching my clit but um it can be problematic when that's all we're doing and then we miss out on like you know cervical orgasms and internal orgasms and all the things so first lay off the clit um and then pay attention to the sensation in your body and reframe how you think of orgasm most of us think of orgasm as like a big explosion, but it it doesn't have to be that. Like orgasm can start before we even touch ourselves, before you even use the wand. It's like this, you know, that buzz of energy in your sex center, that's orgasm, that's orgasmic energy building up. Let it build up, don't rush in. And then breathe, breathe the energy up from your sex center, which is located in your genitals, all the way up, all through your tummy, your heart, out through your arms, up through your head, out through your crown. Like breathing, using breath is so powerful. Um, and then exploring your cervix is like, oh, God. It's just, it's just the gateway to so much bliss and pleasure and healing as a woman. It's the gateway to our womb. So don't be surprised if when exploring that area of your body internally that you a lot of emotion can come up to be healed. Um, okay, next question. Hi, Juliet. I'm 26 and I haven't been in in couple with anybody i have had some small adventures and sexual relationships therefore i wonder if i'm being too rigid and have having too high standards if i haven't met anybody with whom i actually feel a connection that makes me want to settle in a relationship well actually there was one guy but i didn't it didn't work out since he was already engaged in a relationship okay is there a way to know if it's my own standards that are set too high and kind of unrealistic or is this normal I just can't be bothered to start a relationship for the sake of it. And so I wonder if I'm waiting for something completely out of this world. No, not at all. Like, gosh, you're only 26 years old. Like, you're 26. You're a baby. You're so young. Like, just enjoy being single and dating. And um, when the right person comes along, they will come along and you will explore. And It doesn't mean you'll be with them forever and, you know, you may get your heart broken. There's all the risks involved in diving into a relationship. But when they come along, you'll know. And if you are concerned that there are things blocking you from opening your heart and really receiving and giving love, and if if you're concerned there's things blocking you from being deeply intimate and connected to another human, then get some therapy. Again, talk to someone like me who can help you unpack why it is the why you are the way you are because we all have baggage we all have stuff that's holding us back even i and once we can get to the bottom of what that is it just opens our hearts to like it just opens our hearts up to so much love and and like possibility of connection um there's nothing you're so young just keep exploring Keep, you know, connecting to self, number one. Always priority, connection to self and then connecting with others and your person will come along. All right, next question. Oh, another question from the same person. Okay. I feel like there's a difference in my ability to let go if I am self-pleasuring or having sex with someone else. Alone I am much more keen to be in my head and not so much in the body. With someone else I can let myself be held and taken by the other person and be much more present. 
Any tips specifically on dropping more easily into the body when solo lovemaking? I have never experienced an orgasm. I feel this would be key. The short answer is um, getting when you're self-pleasuring, use breath to connect with yourself. So if you're in your head, to drop into your heart and your genitals, your sex center, use breath. So I'm going to put some resources below for this and take your time. Like when we're self-pleasuring, we can often rush. I mean, that happens in sex too, but it can often be a rushed experience and that can lead to us being in our head too, especially if we're in our head. It's like we're racing to the finish line again. We're racing to the big bang and then we get on with our day. But if we can just take time to like truly make love to ourselves, like imagine you're making love to like the most exquisite lover in the world. You're not going to rush. You're not going to race to an explosive orgasm. You're going to take your time to like really explore their body. Um, and so, yeah, I want you to do that with yourself. Make love to yourself. I have to interrupt this episode to let you know that today is sponsored by Pleasure School. Pleasure School is a monthly membership where together we study intimacy, conscious connections and how to embody our true sexual essence. Every month, students of Pleasure School access members-only educational content across a wide range of formats, including written, audio, video and guided home study. Pleasure School is led by myself and I'm also joined by other teachers who are pioneering in the fields of sexuality, relationships and holistic health. This is your chance to join a unique online school like no other in the world. Learn more and join Pleasure School at www.juliet-allen.com. That's J-U-L-I-E-T hyphen A-L-L-E-N dot com. Okay, next question. Hello, Juliet. I hope you and your family are well. I'm launching a holistic kink-friendly sexologist in Mexico next year and I would love for you to share with me some business and personal advice as I'm dealing with the imposter syndrome. Gracias. Um, my biggest piece of advice to someone who's entering into this, this industry is to, to, like, show up for yourself to explore sexually all the time, to have heaps of different experiences. You're going into kink, so it's like obviously that's something you're really interested in personally, so keep exploring and have integrity, you know. Like you can't be a sexologist if you're not having great sex and you don't have to be having great sex all the time, but you do need to be like that needs to be your goal. Like that, that, And you need to have experienced great sex if you want to lead others into experiencing that in, the, in your life. So have... Be super authentic. You know, you can't, it's like you can't be a naturopath, like a natural doctor, if you're not healthy, in my opinion. You know, you see an unhealthy natural doctor and it's like, I'm not going to pay you money to bloody look after me if you're unhealthy and, yeah. So the same goes with a sexologist. Um, You know, you need to walk the talk. That's my advice. Um, so the next question is, um, hi, Juliet, I have a boundary that I usually set with new partners that I don't have penetrative sex outside of a monogamous relationship. I do this because when I have sex before trust is there, I feel really unstable. I found this works well for me personally. I need trust to come before touch. However, I broke my own boundary and had sex with someone first time meeting them. Do you have any tips for recentering myself as I feel really anxious would also appreciate any tips on re-establishing some boundaries for getting to know this person in the dating phase so I don't end up in a situation. Thank you. Okay, first, like, be gentle and kind to yourself. It's okay that you broke a boundary. You know, boundaries, like, are, are important and also if we break a boundary, it, it's okay. Um, it sounds like there was a lot of energy at your sex centres and a big connection there and you just went for it and... We've all done that at some stage, or most of us have, and it's okay. Um, and what I would say, you know, you said you feel anxious. Anxiety is fear of the, the future. It's, it's really good to be aware of. So what are you fearful of? And tips on re-establishing boundaries. What I would say is, you know, if you, like, you really enjoyed that experience but you want to pull back and slow it down, then just say that to them. Express how you're feeling you know, you can tell them exactly what you've told me. Like, I don't usually have penetrative sex. You know, I feel like I need to build trust. I would like to slow things down. 
um, and just go back to exploring sexually without that. And if they are the person for you, they're going to fully respect that. They're going to love that about you. They really are. They're going to love that about you. Um, so I want you to really like own that that's what you need right now. And also back to therapy. <laughs> I mentioned this a lot, but I'm a big advocate. I would get, get some support in exploring like why, um, yeah, why there's that trust stuff there. Because once we get really clear on why we don't trust, it can help us move forward in a really empowered way, especially when it comes to sex and relationships. Um, yeah. Next question. By the way, I'm, I'm breastfeeding and this is perfect. So if you hear little sounds, it's magnolia feeding. But the next question looks like it's about breastfeeding. So that's awesome. Um, so I've been nursing my two-year-old and my body is telling me that it's out of energy and nutrients and ready to wean him but my emotional self is not ready to let go of this time in my life. He's likely my last baby. I feel a lot of satisfaction in the work of nursing as well as good hormones. I feel like it will be a portal to another identity and I don't know how to honour it and jump into the step of taking it. Um, okay, so I, I fully, I've been here, I feel you. Thank you for asking. This is big. Oh, and it can feel so sad. <laughs> it's like... The, the connection that a mother has with their child, their breastfeed, is just next level. Like only a mother knows. Only a mother knows. And such a beautiful gift that you have given your baby. And for two, two years it's just incredible and beautiful that you have like really prioritised that. Um, so celebrating you as a mother, you're amazing and just honouring you. And also... Trust in your body. You said your body is telling you it's out of energy and nutrients and ready to wean him. Trust in that. And I can say that because I've been there. Like with Sol, I thought I would breastfeed him to two and beyond. Um, however, we got to, I guess I got pregnant when he was 17 months old and I breastfed him nearly all the way through the pregnancy. But I got to a stage where I just knew like I was depleted and I was growing out of the child and breastfeeding and I knew it was time and I actually had to have a couple of therapy sessions about it because I was so torn like I did I didn't want to let go I loved the connection we had I loved that it brought him back close to me I was I was like what does this mean for our relationship but then I just yeah I listened and I just knew it was the right timing and that I had to let go of you know what I thought it would be like and so I did it very gradually, like over five months. It was such a gradual process and it just felt so in alignment with where I was at. I didn't want to go cold turkey. Um, and it was perfect. Like I weaned him about two weeks before our daughter was born and she was unexpectedly born early at 30 weeks. So it was like my body knew, like, you need to wean him because you're going to be away from him. Um, they're, they're just so much like it was amazing so please trust in your intuition and like trust in just just trust trust in your body trust in your baby um, and like so many mums I spoke to about this topic spoke about how like they it just actually brought them and their child closer and um, because you connect in different ways when you're not nursing so yeah I hope that helps Next question is, you may have a podcast on this topic already, but trying to understand porn habits of a partner, what's considered normal habits, what's considered borderline addiction, is porn acceptable in a long-term relationship? This topic is general. I'm curious to explore. Me personally don't feel the urge or need to watch porn. Sure, I've dabbled but doesn't really interest me. Would be keen to understand more on this in your thoughts. Look, porn, like, it can be acceptable in any relationship, not just long-term. But it depends on the two people or the three people or however many people are in that relationship as to, like, what they feel comfortable with and what they don't. Um, what's normal, what's not, like, that's different for everybody. You know, for some people it can feel great to put, watch porn every day and for others they can be watching porn every day or every week or every month and just feel like shit. So I tr I, I'm encouraging you to, like, explore what it feels like to watch porn or what it feels like to have a partner who watches porn 
because we're all unique. Like there's no, there's no like cookie cutter piece of advice, whatever you say. My brain's not entirely there, <laughs> postpartum. But there's no like one bit of advice I can give everyone around this. There's nothing wrong with porn, but it can be detrimental to a relationship too. What's addiction? Addiction is needing it to, to like, needing it to function, you know, needing it, like not, not being able to not have it in your life. It is, Nick can talk to this actually. He can talk to this a lot. He's really into learning about addiction. I'm not, I'm not such a big, um, like, expert on addiction, so I'm, I'm actually not going to speak into addiction because it's not my thing as a therapist. But, um, yeah, if I worked with you one-on-one or worked with you and your partner and, you know, explore with you both, like, for you, like, what is there a trigger around your partner watching it? Um, for your partner, um, does, do they feel like it's, it's problematic, you know? These are all the questions I'd ask, but I feel like it's hard to answer just in a like a general Q&A. So I'm sorry I can't help you more. Next question. Dear Juliet, I recently started dating a new partner. We're sexually exclusive and although our sexual intimacy feels very sweet and loving and satisfying, he sometimes struggles to keep an erection. I feel generally quite relaxed about it as I love exploring non-penetrative ways of sex and I reassure him a lot that there is no pressure from my side at all. However, he expressed that he feels quite ashamed and stressed about it and it does affect him emotionally. I'm sure it's a psychological, emotional thing as he is a healthy 20-something man. So my question is, how can I best support him in this situation? I'd love for him to be able to feel relaxed and safe within our shared space of sexual intimacy. Thank you for your work. As always, much love. Great question. I'm going to put some resources below on, like, ejaculation, a couple of conversations I've had with Nick on the podcast that may help. Um, if he's willing to, it'd be good for him to reach out to Nick and do some work with Nick because Nick's worked with like hundreds of men on this topic and he has a lot of um, experience um, as a therapist. He has personal experience. He He's just great at working with men on this topic and great with working at any but one but it would be cool for your partner to um, chat to someone about it because there could be something that's going on there that's in his unconscious awareness that he, he just doesn't, like he doesn't have awareness around, sorry. Um, how you can best support him is doing what you're doing, which is like reassuring him it's okay, you know, go slow um, and and talk about how, how, like encourage him to talk, you know, talk about how he's feeling, Um that it's okay, like any memories he has, like he may have some trauma or he may just have had one experience, like one tiny experience where someone said something to him about his sexuality or his penis or whatever, sex with him, that threw him off. Um, So, yeah, I'll pop the resources below, um, Conversations with Nick, and I recommend he reaches out to Nick and you could actually reach out to Nick too and do a session with him because it's so good as women to get support in relationship from a man if we're in relationship with a man because we get the perspective of a man. Um, So, yeah. Hi, Juliet. What have been some of your favourite and most memorable dates? Always looking for ways to create beautiful experiences with my love and I notice we share similar values as you guys. Um, Look, I love, like, love going out in nature with Nick. Um, having sex in nature it's not happening at the moment with the kids (laughs) but um nature dates are really fun we don't do like restaurant dates we're not we're not into going to restaurants and and eating we like that's just not us we're more adventure dates um that that has to do with nick he's a real adventure guy so like fuck what have we done just so much stuff like so many so much travel you know we don't particularly go on like specific dates like, oh, today we're going on a date or Saturday we're doing a date. We just do life together. I do love a good coffee date though. Like every Monday morning we have a coffee date together. We, we sit down and we leave our toddler with the nanny and we like just have a little coffee and it doesn't even last for that long. And sometimes we don't talk much, but it's like we're just being with each other, having a little ritual. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's it, nature. I don't have heaps of creativity with dates and neither does Nick. It's just like 
I guess memorable dates are like when we've gone into nature and had really great sex in nature, like on top of a mountain or on top of a sand dune or on the beach, on like a deserted beach. They're my memorable dates. Um, Okay, let's see how many. Oh, there's one more and it's very lengthy. So I'm going to read it. Um, Yeah, I'll read it. Dear Juliet, I hope you and your family are all healthy and happy. I would love to hear your opinion on the situation. I've been now since this summer dating a man and we get along really well. I don't think I've ever met someone with whom I was this comfortable talking about anything. Feel understood and loved and we are aligned under several aspects. The only downside is that he has two kids with his ex that she, that she really desired but he didn't as he was very young and, and younger than her. And since they're still relatively young, six and four, he feels like he still has to be present for them and doesn't want to show them that he has someone else as they might not understand his situation and suffer from it, and that he'll be more confident about talking clearly to them in a couple of years. I do understand this truth, but it also means he still tries to be present for them at least during weekends. And since we both work full-time during the week and live one hour distance from each other, sometimes it doesn't leave a lot of time for us to share together. He also said he's really confident about our relationship but feels bad sometimes to keep me waiting and on my side I sometimes wonder if I'm actually doing the right thing, even though I'm not doubting on him as the wrong person. He's told me it's mostly on me to decide if I want to see other people too, but anyway, he will still be there for me. I feel like he's really doing his best to be present for me and I really appreciate that. I, however, would love to be able to get to know him better and better by doing activities together. Let me just skim through this. It's quite lengthy. Um Let me take things slowly with him. Let's take it easy for himself on the other side. I don't want to. Okay. So you're also asking me how I did, like, this with my first daughter when I was a single woman. Um, And I went, did I go through similar feelings? How did you face the thing and how was it perceived by the other person? Oh, okay. This is a big one. So, like, it sounds like you really love this man and he loves you and... You really want it to work. Um, and I understand where he's coming from and that he wants to prioritise his children. Um, however, he also needs to prioritise you if he's really committed to a relationship with you. And if he's really committed to, you know, being a role model for his kids and prioritising intimacy and connection and love. And that's something that his kids need to be around and see, in my opinion. Um, if he feels like it's a really solid relationship. I do, I am a a really big advocate of not, like, as a single parent with kids, not introducing the kids to anyone too soon. So I think it's great that he's he's waiting for the right time. Um, I'm not sure how long you have been dating, though. It doesn't say. Um, But... I I respect him for his decision and also there needs to be a bit of leniency there. Um, So it's like for you, you know, can you wait two years to have his children in your life and for him to introduce you to his ex and all the things that would need to happen? Or um, do you want things to progress sooner? Like get clear on your values. What do you want? Do you want monogamy? Do you want to be seeing other people? Is this man worth waiting? You know, do you... Hey, Bubba girl. Hang on a moment. It's it's like it's worth getting clear on what you want. Like are you both aligned with your future plans and intentions for this relationship? You know, does he want more kids? Do you want more kids? All the things. These are the conversations you need to be having. And I'd actually recommend doing the Intimacy Blueprint course that Nick and I um, put together Um it's really, really great for couples to get clear on their blueprint, like creating a blueprint for your relationship and really diving deep into like your values and your values that you have individually but also as a couple and, yeah, making sure that you're aligned. So I recommend doing that. Um, you could do some therapy like coaching. If I open my books, I'm happy to work with you both or I'm happy to work with you because I'd be really interested in helping you get clear on what you want moving forward. Um, Nick is also a great therapist um, too so there's two options and obviously my option depends on whether I open my books in 2024. Um, I'm just reading. 
okay, you asked me my, like what I did, you know, when my first daughter was born and I was a single mum. So I had a rule. Um, I didn't introduce my daughter to new men or new people, I should say, because I was in a relationship with a woman for a long time. Um, new people, like for a while. So, you know, three, four, five months. And then I introduced them as a friend and, you know, spend a little bit of time every now and then. Um, and this was when she was younger. Um, I just, I really separated um, dating. So I had my daughter every second weekend um, and also through the week. So on my weekend that I didn't have her, that was when I dated. That was when I saw lovers. That's when I had sex, all the things. And when she was with me, I spent time with her. And, you know, my belief was like, I only wanted to attract people into my life as lovers and partners who really like got that and who respected my my opinion and who, who actually agreed that, that was the best way forward. Um, yeah, that was important for me. And like anyone who didn't get it, they were out. I was like, nah. Um, but it, I didn't wait two years. Like that life's too short. If I felt 100% certain about a new partner, which there's only been like... I think two or three that I've introduced Millie to over the years, then um, if I felt certain about them, then it was important that within, I reckon, five months that that they met Millie and, yeah, it was important. So we're also different though, right? Like what works for you doesn't work for me, et cetera. Um, Yeah, I just like communicate heaps um, with him get some outside help, <clears throat> do the intimacy blueprint, which will open again in 2024. Um, and, yeah, I hope I hope this has helped. Um, once I open my books for coaching, please, like, book in. Let's do a session. I'll help you out. All right. That's it for today's Q&A. Thank you for asking the questions. I appreciate you all. And I love how curious you are to learn and explore and grow, you know, in all these areas of your lives. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Authentic Sex Podcast. If you love the show, please hit follow wherever you are listening and leave me a review. And if you really, really, really loved it, please share the podcast with your friends, family and social media followers. Doing this together as a community, we can make an impact and support the world to feel more sexually empowered and free and just get the word out about these free resources. If you'd like to join me for daily updates and inspiration, you can find me on Instagram, which is at Juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T underscore Allen, A-L-L-E-N. And you can also head on over to my website to join any of my offerings, Pleasure School, The Intimacy Blueprint, uh, and you can also treat yourself to the Juliet Pleasure Wand at www.juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T hyphen Allen, A-L-L-E-N dot com.